best way to understand superheat and subcooling is to begin with latent heat and sensible heat. Sensible heat is easy because we can sense it, we can feel it, and we can measure it. When you work up a sweat on a job or you're outside in a cold in the wintertime, the thermostat on the wall that tells you the temperature of the room, these are all forms of sensible heat that we're very familiar with. Blatant heat, on the other hand, is hidden. It is the energy that goes into or comes out of a substance while it's changing state, like water from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas without changing its temperature. Let me show you a visual demonstration on the difference between latent heat and sensible heat. Now in the background, I have a ceramic space heater that's putting out over 200 degrees of hot air directly on this glass of ice water. In that glass of ice water, I have a temperature probe, and to the left there you can see we're taking a temperature reading. Now as we get our time lapse underway, most of the heat being injected into this glass of ice water is being consumed by the ice cubes. This is the energy needed to transition the ice from a solid to a liquid, but very little heat is left over to actually change the temperature of the water, which is sensible heat. As you can see, we're seven minutes of real time dumping 200 degrees of hot air directly on this glass of ice water, and we've only changed the temperature of the water about two degrees. So all that heat has gone into fueling the process of that change of state from a solid to a liquid. As the ice melts away, we don't need as much heat to fuel the process of converting from a solid to a liquid because there's less ice. More of that heat becomes available to change the temperature of the actual water itself. As more of the ice disappears, more heat becomes available to change sensible heat, and the quicker our temperature of the water will begin to rise. Once the ice fully melts and the transition process is complete from solid to liquid, we no longer need any energy to fuel that process, and so now all the heat can go into changing sensible temperature. And you can see now how rapidly the temperature of water is now increasing. This is the exact same process that's occurring in an evaporator coil in an air conditioning system. When a metering device injects liquid into the evaporator coil, that liquid is kind of like the ice in our glass of water. Um, that liquid refrigerant is going to absorb all the heat from the home that's flowing over that coil in order to change the state of the refrigerant from a liquid to a vapor. But very little of that heat is gonna go into changing the temperature of the refrigerant itself. Now as the refrigerant travels through the evaporator coil, more and more of it transitions into a vapor. And just like in our cup of ice water, when we have less ice, we don't need as much heat to keep fueling that process. And so more sensible heat starts to become available to change the temperature of the refrigerant. Now by the time the refrigerant gets to the other side of the evaporator coil, it's now all completely a vapor just like all of the ice melted in our glass of ice water and now it's all water. So now all the heat from the home traveling over that coil can now 100% go into changing the temperature of the refrigerant itself. Now when you hook up your gauge manifold and you look at the low side gauge, it's going to give you a pressure. And with that pressure, there's going to be a temperature that correlates with it. So for example, if we were putting our gauges on a 410A system, at 100 PSI, we would have a correlating temperature of roughly 30, 32 degrees. This is saturation temperature. This is the temperature that the liquid refrigerant in the evaporator coil begins to transition from a liquid to a vapor. Just like our ice at that same temperature will start transitioning from a solid to a liquid as you start adding heat to it. When we put a temperature probe on the suction line and we measure its sensible temperature, what we're measuring is how much heat was added to the refrigerant after it converted from a liquid to a vapor, just like we were measuring how much heat was added to our water once all the ice melted. Now, the difference between your saturated temperature, which at 100 PSI is 32 degrees, and your actual sensible temperature that you're measuring on the copper line that difference is your superheat. So if we were measuring 50 degrees on our copper line with a 100 PSI, 32 degrees saturation, we have 18 degrees of superheat. And this is how much heat we're adding to the refrigerant once it turns into a vapor. So what does this mean? What purpose does it serve in us knowing this? 
An air conditioning system relies on cooling the air in the home through this latent heat transfer process. That process of converting the refrigerant from a liquid to a vapor, which is our saturation temperature on the gauge. When we measure superheat or how much the refrigerant has heated up once this transition process is complete, that number is kind of telling us what our insurance policy is for the compressor because a compressor cannot compress a liquid, only gases. So we want a certain superheat value to make sure we're not slugging our compressor with liquid refrigerant. When our superheat value is too low, what that means is that we have so much liquid refrigerant in the evaporator coil that by the time it changes to a vapor, it's almost already out of the coil. And so we don't see an actual change in the sensible temperature of the refrigerant itself. And this is borderline threatening the compressor because at this point, we could be risking having liquid refrigerant make its way back to the compressor and slug it. If our superheat is too high, on the other hand, that means whatever liquid refrigerant in our evaporator coil is boiling off way too early. And so the change in the temperature of the refrigerant itself starts happening earlier and it increases the temperature more. So if you have a superheat of like say 40 degrees, you're doing a super job at protecting the compressor. But as I said earlier, most of the cooling process is through that latent heat transfer. And if that process is ending too soon in the evaporator coil, we lose a large part of our actual cooling capacity.